Good evening and welcome to the Environment and Planning Committee meeting on Monday the 8th of August 2022. I'd like to declare the meeting open at 7pm. Uh, I will go to our, the acknowledgement of country. The, the council acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which this meeting is being held as that of the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Notice of live streaming of the committee meeting. Staff and public are reminded that this meeting is being recorded for minute taking purposes and is also being webcast live on council's website. This recording will be made available on council's website, the code of meeting practice. The order of, meet of business is as shown in the agenda, which has been made available. Staff and public are reminded that this meeting is open. Doors to the meeting room are to be left open unless the meeting moves into a closed or confidential session, according to section 13 of the code of meeting practice. Council's code of meeting practice prohibits the electronic recording of meetings without the express permission of council. Mobile phones must be turned to silent during the meeting. Apologies. Uh, do we have any apologies for this evening? No? Everyone's in attendance? Thank you. Disclosures, uh, disclosures of interest. Do councillors have any interest to, dis to declare tonight? Councillor Marnie? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, um, on ENV 02322, um, I've had a relative in that facility and I've, I've put in this closure this afternoon. Thanks, Councillor Marty, that's a significant non-pecuniary, so you'll be leaving the chamber for that one. Thank you. Okay, public participation on items on the agenda. Tonight, we have five speakers registered for tonight's meeting. Speakers one, two, and five are here in person. Speaker three will have their submission read by staff. Speaker four will address the meeting remotely. I would like to remind speakers that speakers have a three minute time limit. The first sound you hear will indicate that you have 30 seconds remaining. At the, second sound, uh, at the second sound, please conclude your comments. So we'll move to our first speaker, which is uh, Ian Cady on behalf of me, Cone, and Ian is addressing us in person. Come forward, thank you. Oh, sorry, it's on the ENB 032-22, report on submissions, planning, proposal, and development control plan, 53A to 59A, Gloucester Road, Hurstville. Thanks, Mr. Cady. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the existing residential care facility on the site is, is quite outdated and has been there for many decades. Uh, it requires many residents to share a room and it also has quite limited on-site community facilities. In accordance with the Royal Commission's report into aged care quality and safety, the proposed additional building height and floor space will allow each resident to be accommodated within their own well-sized room with a private bathroom and allow common facilities to be expanded to include a cafe, hairdresser, day spa and function rooms. No increase is proposed to the maximum number of beds currently approved on the facility. This proposal is not about expanding the facility, it is about providing a suitably dignified level of accommodation and care for residents, and that being the existing number of residents that are already approved there. The Georges River Community Strategic Plan 2018 to 2028 identifies that 92% of residents identified aged care facilities as a critical issue for council. And Council's George's River Local Housing Strategy identifies that there has been significant growth in the 50 to 69 year age group over the last 10 year period, and that's expected to continue. In terms of the details of the proposal, while an indicative design has been submitted and assessed by officers, the proposal before you does not seek to approve that design. There's an, an indicative design. All that is a, a proposed at this point in the process is an increase in the height in the FSR controls. I'd also emphasize that there is no rezoning. And also that those controls are only proposed to change specifically for the use of a residential aged care facility. The changes proposed are an increase in height from nine meters to largely 12 metres, but also stepping up to 14 and 16.9 metres in a very limited area. And the FSR is proposed to increase from 0.9 to 1.6 for the specific use. Following the recent exhibition of the application, there were 14, a total of 14 submissions received. One was in support of the proposal. 
Another was from Transport for New South Wales, who has requested the relocation of a bus stop, and we have no objection to that and happy to accept that. Of the 12 objectors, we understand from the council officer's report that these were largely from the residents of the Millet Street aged facility to the rear and raises very various amenity issues in terms of solar access, privacy, traffic, etc. Uh, we've reviewed the officer's assessment of all of these issues at pages 42 to 45 of their report and uh, agree entirely. I think that's a very uh, thorough and professional assessment of those issues. Indeed, we've been working with council officers for a couple of years now going through this process um, and I'm very happy with the way officers have handled all of the matters. The housing set specifically provides for aged care facilities to be a bit larger than the immediate surrounding residential development. And that's evidenced all, all, all across Sydney. And it's quite a normal occurrence. The proposal conforms to all relevant standards, and I'll, I'll wrap up shortly, all relevant standards in terms of privacy overshadowing and all the other matters uh, raised in objections. And is the um, amendment is accompanied by a 13 page development control plan that covers in great detail all of the issues raised by objectors. Any one particular issue I did want to touch on is uh, parking and traffic. The housing set requires a minimum of 29 car spaces. We're proposing 41 to accommodate the what we see as appropriate demand. Uh, traffic uh, modelling has, or, or traffic report accompanying the application, calculates an increase of a maximum of three vehicle trips per hour during the peak hour period. So that's one, one additional car every 20 minutes. Uh, so again, um, I would commend the application to you and noting that we are not seeking to expand this facility but just to provide a, a more dignified level of care and accommodation for the people who are living there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katie. Our next speaker for tonight is also here in person, Wei Ming Lo. Are you here in the gallery? Wei Ming? <laughs>先生们、女生们、你们好 你们这个楼是比谁住的？我们这个楼只是那个允许老年人和低收入住。Dear sir, madam, uh, today I come to this meeting. I uh, would like to uh, express uh, my objection to this uh, de uh, development proposal. Um, in our building, uh, we um, the people, majority people live in our building are the uh, uh, older people and people with uh, some sort of disability. Oh, oh, all the residents has to be um, either uh, old age or uh, disability. If um, the extension of this um, development will have an impact on our residents because um, it uh, will 
um, extend, extend the, the um, east and south, yeah. east and south, and we will lose the sunshine in our um, units. 不只是阳光挡了，自然光线也挡了。如果要是真的加盖，那我们那个房间里头就整个就是黑的。Um, if the extension of the development go ahead, um, um, the building, the new building, will block our um sunlight. 而且对我们的影响非常大，不只是阳光，还有噪音。噪音有时候包括现在人少一些，还好一些。老年人有的时候晚上整夜的在那喊。I'm sorry. Please continue. 而而且，员工大声说话、吸烟，还有厨房的噪音，还有洗衣房的噪音都很大，对我们的影响很大。如果再加电，那就是业务提高了，就是这些事情更多了。而且我们在我们楼前的那个趴车位也没有，我们的。朋友、亲人、朋友来到楼前都没办法停车，基本上都是他们老人院，好多他们老人院的车停在我们门口，一停就是一天。Um, if the HK residents increase, um, the noise from the uh the, the residents, um, washing, talking, uh, cooking. And will impact、um, our life, and the parking spot、uh, will be decreased.、Uh, currently, the resident,、uh, the visitor of the、um, nursing home, already parking along the street.、Um, when they park, they will park for whole a、uh, full day. Um, 还有就是。它直接影响我们的光和光线，在十几年前，它就在我们的南边加盖了一层。本来那上面每那前面是一个停车场，它加盖了一层，就影响我们一部分光线和和 view。然后现在，嗯，我们前些日子、前些天了解到，它在我们的东边和南边继续加盖。如果东边，东边再盖，那我们所有的阳光就都没了。Uh, ten years ago, this、um, HK facility already、uh, has extend one level.、Um, it has impact to our、uh, the brightness of our units. And recently, they extend extend the east and the south. So、um, that means we will don't have the eastern、uh, sunlight. 还有 ，Council 在二零一七年提出 George River 地区的 light 和 DK DCP 是什么？我不知道。嗯，并在二零二二年。正式实行这个新的 light 和 decode decode， 但是这个新的规划里并没有提升这个老人院计划里面的，并没有包括提升这个养老院的 F S R 和限高。你说你有什么来着？ LEP, LEP, or DCP. Okay. Excuse me, Jane. Okay. Yes. 
Uh, we're going to need um, our speaker to conclude her comments. Yeah. Um, so she said that in 2007, the council um, council has developed the LEP. At 2022, and um, it was the ELP. Don't oh, DCP. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, in these two plans, uh, there's nothing that to uh, increase the, nothing mentioned to increase the age facilities, um, FF2. Okay, thank you, um, Islao. Um, unfortunately, your time is up. And thank you, Jane, for translating. I'm sorry, but we only can allow speakers three minutes, and I think we've gone a little bit longer than that this time, but we understood what you were saying, Ms. Lau. Um, I'm going to, oh, our next speaker is Lily Kang, and her submission will be read out by one of our staff members. Again, that's on ENB 032-22, the Planning Proposal and Development Control Plan for 53-59 Gloucester Road, Hurstville. We are strongly against this planning proposal as it will block nature light and too close our windows. No any privacy. This will ruin our rest of life. The end. Thanks, Ms. McKinley. Our next speaker is going to be addressing us remotely. Uh, Mr. Brad Muller is also speaking on ENB 032-22, the 53-59A Gloucester Road planning proposal. Is Mr. Muller online? Hello, Brad Muller speaking. Hi, Mr. Muller. Uh, you have three minutes, so please go ahead. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Brad Muller. I'm actually a um, development manager with Regis. Uh, I was asked just to uh, make myself available for the meeting tonight if there was any uh, any questions. So, I'd, um, sorry, I've had some audio problems, so I don't know whether uh, I assume Ian Katie from Mekan has spoken. Um, I didn't really have anything further to ask, but uh, to add, but if there's anything, uh, any questions, uh, I was just asked to make myself available. Thanks, Mr. Muller. Do any of the councillors have any questions for Mr. Muller? We did actually hear from Mr. Katie earlier in public forum. Any any questions, councillors? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Muller. We'll we'll leave it there. Oh, great. Thank. You. Sorry to hang on one, one moment, please. We do have a question yeah. from Councillor Wang. So, so mm -hmm. through you, Madam Chair. Um, so the, should I ask a question now or is, uh, should I ask, discuss after the, you know, the public speaker is over? Are you asking a question of Mr. Muller while he's online or were you asking a question of staff? Because I think the, the purpose now is he is online to answer questions from councillors if they have any. But if your question is more directly to staff, we can leave it till we move to the item. Okay, hold on, leave, leave it. Leave You'll leave it? Okay, thanks, Councillor Wang. And thank you for your time tonight, Mr. Miller, but um, we don't have any further questions for you. We'll move to our next speaker, which is Michelle Zhang, who will be addressing us in person, again on ENB 032-22, the Planning Proposal and Development Control Plan for 53 to 58 Gloucester Road, Hurst Hall. Uh, Ms. Zhang, if you're in the gallery, can you please come forward? And you'll have three minutes to address us and you'll get, uh, after a couple of minutes, you'll, you'll get a, a warning bell that will be time to conclude your comments. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you can see our residence, our building is SEPP55. That means the residents live inside must be either over 55 or with disability. We are vulnerable people. So However, we are human beings. We are residents. We, we live in 
Delta River Council area. We love this area. We want to have our own standard quality of life. So all of the residents, total 31 units, are against this plan. Reasons one, it's too close to our building. That building is to our building because that building is L, L shape, and our building is L shape as well. They are wall to our wall only 1.5 meters. So currently, some years ago, they added one floor, one level story already. And they are going to add another two story. So most of our units could not receive the natural light at all. First of all, secondly, it reduced our privacy because too close. So they are resident on the top level two and level three could see our room through the window to could see our room very easily directly. Also, they are that it car 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 car. It's located at our side, middle street. They are car park. It's not located at other side. They are front side. No, not at all. So, and they are car park. It's limited. I think currently just uh, maybe just ten or fifteen car parks spaces. So. Currently, they are staff sometimes park to our visit parking because they don't have enough car park space. And also, they are staff park their car at our side, main street. And uh, one day last month, one of the, their staff even followed our car and the, our security car park and park our, one of the, our owner car park. It's ridiculous. Also, if that bike is increased, if their facility is increased to 100 bag, that means more traffic, more cars, and more people. So the exit rate will be increased significantly. And our life, quality of our, our life will be reduced significantly. Also, a second. Also, because currently that building is too close to our building. So when they are also they are that facility teaching is directly face to our building. And the cooking, noisy people, people are talking, joking, and even sometimes their staff are not working, even during the working time, talking, joking loudly. They already affect our life. I have completed twice already to their management and nothing happened. I even complained to them directly to their facility manager. Thank you, Ms. Zhang. Um, your three minutes have up. Could you, would you mind just winding up if you've just got something quickly to wind up with? Okay, so we are SEPT 55 building. As human beings and also as good residents here, we always pay council fee on the time. So we are eligible to receive our own quality of life. So if that L because the facility, its care facility is L L J if increased. Okay. And Thank you, Ms. Affect our life. Thank you very much for your time and thank you to all the speakers in public forum tonight. Um, we're all speaking on the same issue. Thank you for your time. Um, now we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the confirmation of minutes from the uh, 11th of Environment and Planning Committee meeting held on the 11th of July. So can I have a mover for that, please? Moved by the Mayor, seconded by Councillor Jamison. All those in favour? Right. Anyone against? Okay, we'll declare that one carried. Uh, now we'll move to our first item on the agenda, which is ENV 022 
2022, the Development and uh, Building Department Functions and Services Metrics Report for Quarter 4, 2021 to 22. And hang on, let me just bring that up, sorry. Okay, so that is the first item on the agenda. Well, could I get a mover in a second just so then we can uh, ask questions and speak to it? Move. I better move that. Yeah. Moved by Councillor Ted, great. And a seconder, yeah. seconded by the Mayor. Thank you. Okay, well, this is a receiver note of the Development and Building Department Functions and Services Metrics Report. And I'm just going to defer to the Director just to give us a bit of a quick overview. Ms Bishop, if you could do that. Thank okay, you. Thanks through you, Madam Chair. Um, as the Chair has indicated, this is just a, uh, our regular report we provide to you about each quarter. So this is reporting on quarter four of 21-22, the period between April and June uh, this year. So just some quick highlights through the quarter we received. There were 45 applications lodged and 130 applications determined, which even I think is pretty impressive in that quarter. Our processing times are a little bit high in relation to our DAs. We're at 166 days and we should be around 85, but there's a whole range of reasons for that I, don't, I won't go into as part of this process. In, uh, the value of the applications determined is 71 million, also fairly impressive. Uh, in relation to, we are required to report to you on the variations to the controls that have occurred. So in this quarter, seven of those 45, or sorry, seven applications that were determined uh, had variations in relation to building height, mainly due to site topography. 22 of the applications were considered by the planning panel all except one that supported the officer's recommendation. With that one, it was a, a deferral for amended plans. Building certificates lodged, uh, uh, 12 lodged, 23 determined. We are fairly excessive in the processing days for those because we're still we're clearing a significant backlog that goes back to 2013. I have been actively working with the staff to clear those older uh, building certificates. Now we are just back now doing 2021 and 2022. CECs that are compliant development certificates. Uh, overall, there are about 160 logged, lodged in that quarter, uh, seven with council. So our percentage there is, is 4%. Um, neither here nor there on that one. Construction certificates as well. Uh, just under 50 lodged and three of them were, were considered by council. Uh, we continue, I'll just indicate, we do continue to have issues with the planning portal. As you know, all applications go through the portal. Uh, we are allocating resources to keep them moving through, but I, I do acknowledge there is frustrations that do occur for, for residents and developers that work in that space. Thank you, Ms. Bishop. Councillors, do we have any questions of Ms. Bishop? No, thank okay. you. Ms. I'll take that as a no. Um, thank you, Ms. Bishop, for that. This again, I've said this before, but this is a really worthwhile report. It's got a lot of information. It's very useful information about just how hard the planning department is working with all of the moving parts in there. And I'm always quite fascinated with what one of the last points you touched on, the number of uh, private certified, private, not private certifiers compared to council certified items is um, getting, you know, more, more sort of polar opposites, I think. Anyway, enough of that. Thank you. If no one's got any further questions, we might move that. And given that it's uh, not specifically, well, I think we can just do a who's all those in favour? All those in favour? Anyone against? Okay, we'll declare that one carried. Move on to the next item, which is ENV 023-22, which is report on submissions for the planning proposal and development control plan for 53A to 59A, Gloucester and Percival. Councillor Mani is just leaving the chamber. And if I could get a... Move the recommendation. Moved by the Mayor. Is anyone going to second that? I'll second that, Chair. Seconded by Councillor Tegg. Thank you. Uh, Ms Bishop, will Ms McMahon be speaking to this? Ms McMahon will outline Thank that. Thank you. Ms McMahon, if you could just give a bit, a bit of an overview. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. The purpose of this report is to advise on the outcome of the public ex exhibition of the planning proposal that seeks to amend the Georges River Local Environmental Plan by inserting a local provision specifically to increase the height and floor space ratio for a residential care facility at 53A, 59A, Gloucester Road, Hurstville. The site already contains a residential care facility. The original planning proposal request was submitted in November 2017 in relation to the site. Since lodgement, and it's been nearly five years, the proposal has been modified on numerous occasions by the proponent who has worked with officers to address amenity impacts to the surrounding development and to within the development itself. The concept scheme in its amended form has also been reviewed externally by an architectural and a planning firm um, to um, check the design and the amenity of the site within the site and surrounding the site. The current version submitted in April this year seeks to permit an, a residential care facility, which is a nursing home on the site, with a FSR of 1.6 to 1 and heights ranging from 12 metres, 14 metres and 16.9 metres. It will involve the demolition. Any DA that is approved um, if this uh, planning proposal is gazetted, any DA will seek the demolition of all structures on the site and the construction of a part three and part four storey residential care facility. There is no increase in the number of beds in the residential care facility from that now approved at the site. There are currently 110 beds and there will remain 110 beds. The main focus of the plant proposal is to upgrade the residential care facility in line with federal government legislation. The proposal also seeks to increase the number of car parking spaces on the site from 24 to 41. The planning proposal was considered by the council's local planning panel on two occasions. On the first occasion, the local planning panel deferred it for additional information on the heights and on the setbacks and on the provisions of the housing state policy itself. The LPP also requested that a development control plan be prepared that accompanied the planning proposal. The LPP on the 5th of August supported the planning proposal. Council supported the planning proposal in October 2021 and the planning proposal was referred for a gateway determination. The Department of Planning did its own urban design assessment on the proposal um, and which um, it complied with the, the concept plan that was lodged by the proponent back in April this year, addressed all the Department of Planning's concerns in, in terms of external and internal amenity. The planning proposal was exhibited for a period of 20, exceeding 28 days from early May to early June. A total of 13 community submissions and one public authority submission was received. Of the community submissions received, 12 did object on the grounds of loss of privacy, views, solar access, building height, odour, waste generation, fire hazard, traffic and car parking and noise impacts. There was one community submission that supported the proposal as, seen, as being seen as beneficial to the community and to the residential care facility itself. One submission was received from a public authority, Transport for New South Wales, and that related to the relocation of the bus stop. Again, I state that the planning proposal has been supported by independent urban design advice, by councillor officer urban design assessment, and also by an assessment that was carried out by the Department of Planning when the request for gateway was lodged. The proposed density is considered suitable and there is no increase in the number of beds on the site. The building height proposed at three storeys with a partial fourth storey is supported um, and it has been demonstrated that the impacts of the additional height 
at the site will not have an adverse impact on the amenity of sites surrounding it. We have required and the proponent has accepted a six metre setback to along the rear southwestern boundary of the site, which is the boundary adjoining um, where the speakers who are objecting uh, to the proposal are from. Other, si other side boundaries are three metres. The proposal now provides for an appropriate level of deep soil planting, which will help with the screening. And it also has provided a great, a good level of articulation and modulation along Gloucester Road in order to fit in with the streetscape along Gloucester Road. The development has been designed in terms of solar impact as follows. The existing apartment building basically to the south of the site where the objectors reside in Millet Street will get three hours of solar access to the windows on its northeast elevation, uh, roughly from about 12 noon to 3 p.m. in the afternoon at the winter solstice. And that's the building that is closer uh, to the proposed site. There's a part of the building in Millet Street which has a further setback from the proposed site that will um, retain its solar access from a just after 9am in the morning in midwinter. Within the proposed development itself, um, which is what we as officers were also concerned about, 70% um, of the bedrooms within the site will achieve a two plus, two hours plus of solar access in midwinter and less than 30 less than 15% of the resident bedrooms achieve no direct solar access during the middle of the winter. The, as I said, the proposal does not seek to intensify the use. It seeks to upgrade the existing nursing home um, to modern day standards. Given, given that there is no increasing beds, it's unlikely to generate additional traffic volumes. However, additional parking has been provided on the site. The report has recommended no changes to the exhibited planning proposal and only one minor change to the exhibited um, development control plan relating to the relocation of the bus stop on Gloucester Road. The report recommends that the planning proposal be forwarded to the Department of Planning and Environment for Gazetteal and that Council adopt the amendment to the Georges River Development Control Plan that will apply to the site. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parliament. Questions, Councillors? Councillor Wang, you had a question earlier? Yes, yes, yes through you, Madam Chair, but to the directors. So I have a couple of questions. So first, what's the the closest the distance between these two buildings because I heard different numbers 1.5 meters, 3 meters, 6 meters. I, I can answer that through Madam Chair. You want the distance to the boundary, Councillor Wang? Yeah, the, the closest distance between right. these two buildings. You know. All right, the distance, well, close di distance between the two buildings, it's six metres to the boundary, and then it is... Eight metres um, to the closest part of the building to the south, and it has a setback of... 34 metres to... Um, to the part of the building um, where there's open space between the proposed site and the residential flat building to the south. So it goes from eight metres to 34 metres. There's nothing like the three metres. No, no, we, we required the building to the south, um, a setback of six metres to the side, sorry, to the side adjacent to where the where the car park will be, there is a setback of 3.4 metres. But that's to its western uh, oh, neighbour. Yeah. yeah, it's to its western, it's on the western side, so you don't have any solar impact there. 
to the subject site, to the residential flat building to the south. And your, yeah. and your window. Sorry? Or I think window, window, you know, for the natural night. So. There, they are proposing windows. Um, I'll just go to and that the window facing that uh, wall. Yeah, they, they are proposing windows along that part of the development site, yes. Sorry? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, so the, the some of the residents on the neighboring uh, a neighboring residence building, they will have a window open to the right. proposed uh, right. wall. The setback yeah. of the proposed building yeah. to the residential flat building uh, uh, on that western boundary yeah. goes from uh, 10 meters and to the window it's 12 meters and then at, right at the front of the side it is six meters so okay. you've actually okay. got some pretty generous setbacks along that um western okay. boundary okay thank you so so as uh, as you just heard so this uh, neighboring 24 minute street the host of the, the senior people or the disabled people so in, in this uh, planning proposal uh, have we got any special considerations uh, given to those most uh, vulnerable people um, through you, Madam Chair, the Councillor Wang, it, no matter who is living within uh, within residence surrounding a site that we're looking with a planning pro proposal, we look at the amenity impacts that as that will occur as a result of that development on those adjoining properties. So, as Ms. McMahon had mentioned, she's discussed the the solar access, or as being mentioned, solar access is looked at, loss of privacy is looked at. Um, the visual impact is looked at. So while we don't specifically look at the, who is living in those properties, yep. it's not something that we do really because it's not possible for planning staff to know who is living in those buildings. But all those buildings, all the impact issues of a proposed development on buildings surrounding the site are all looked at in relation to solar access, privacy and visual impact. That's just as, as, as a minimum. And remember, we're talking about a planning proposal, not a development application. Yeah. So when a development application is lodged for the site, yeah. those those issues are looked at in great detail. And if required, mitigating measures will put in, are put in place to try and address those issues, in particular privacy. OK, OK, thank you. So I have further questions. So, so I know there's no plan to increase the number of beds now, but with the increase the you know flows and the capacity so what's the you know the guarantee there will be no future increase of beds and the intensity of use in the future for example if the legislation relax you know in the future uh through you madam chair i'll commence this answer ms mcmahon may wish to add to it this planning proposal is addressed in a particular way. There is a local provision, so a provision in the local environmental, in our local environmental plan that specifically relates to this site and how we are ensuring that the density of the site is not increased. So, for example, it doesn't go from a retirement village, sorry, a nursing home to a block of flats. Yeah. There is a provision in there that indicates that the, the additional floor space that will be received as a result of this planning proposal is only linked to, uh, is it a, a residential aged care facility? So it, it can only be used for a specific use. So that will then, won't allow the site to be used for a, a residential flat building or a, it, it, it just needs to be used for, for aged care. Ms. McMahon, did you want to add anything to that? Um, yes, I will through you, Madam Chair. The the draft development control plan on page um, 52 of the business paper has um, a section on bedroom yield. So we've actually indicated there that the maximum number of beds is 110. And, and we've actually indicated the, number, the total amount of bedroom floor space. We, we really... Um, yeah, we've really been specific with the number of beds, the amount of bedroom floor space that the proposal or any development application can meet. Um, so we, we have put as many controls as possible in to address um, the issue of growth, you know, if 
additional bedrooms or, or bedroom floor space is sought. Okay, so it, uh, just through you, Madam Chair. So in, in that area and that street, apart from this building, is there any other building can you know go as high as you know four stories? Through you, um, Madam Chair, no. Um, only the Gloucester Road Private Hospital at the end. Yeah, yeah it's in a different zoning, uh, infrastructure zoning, so it can, but the rest of the street, it has to meet the current zoning requirements. So, so we're, we're making an exception to the zoning? Yeah, given that, um, we're, given that it is a current nursing home, it either gets um, redeveloped to meet the federal government guidelines or it closes down. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Thanks. Sorry, Madam Chair, can I ask you one more question? Yeah, so the, so because when I read through the, read through the, doc, the reports, lots of the concerns are uh, addressed, deferred, referred to future DA approval. But if this, uh, my question is, if this PP is approved, the floor space, FSI, and the, and the height will go up. So how can the DA control that, uh, you know, physical increase of capacity, like a loss of light? There's no way the DA can control that. Is that the fair statement? Uh, so, the pla a planning proposal, that is its purpose, to change the controls yeah. on the site, as you've said. So it's change in height and change in FSR. Yeah. What has been indicated here, and the report indicates, and Mrs. M Ms. McMahon has reiterated, that the, a development control plan has been prepared to try and ensure that, the that, that, that there is clear guidance on how that the site will be developed with once a development application is lodged. So with a development application, of course, it allows the site to be looked at in detail. It allows the development to be looked at in detail. It also allows amendments to that development to occur. What the provisions in the planning proposal give is a maximum, all right? Not all the site has to be developed to that maximum. So as a result of the development application, it may be elements of the site that because of overshadowing may require, whether it's to the property in Millet Street or other properties around the site, may require the de development to be redesigned to ensure that those amenity issues are protected. And I'll reinforce again, the controls in an LEP are a maximum. It doesn't mean that the developer or the planning staff or the determining body will allow it to develop to that maximum, ensuring that the whole site is looked at comprehensively, not only in relation to the built form, but also in relation to it, how it operates. So that's traffic, it's waste, it's noise, and it's its hours. All those things are addressed not by planning proposal, because that only talks about the envelope. Yeah. It is about how that DA is assessed. Okay, thank you. Thank thanks, Ms. Bishop and Ms. McMahon, and thanks, Councillor Wang, for your questions. Questions? Um, I guess we'll go to Councillor Jamison first and then to the Mayor. Um, sorry, I'm just going to ask like black and white questions so I can get this. So, the issues that was brought up by those speakers, yeah. were they addressed? So, the, were the, the application changed to address these issues? Um, through you, Madam Chair, um, we the application, the planning proposal didn't have to be amended to address the concerns raised by the residents because they were concerns raised by the council officers at the beginning of this process and that's why it's taken five years to get to this point. Um, so we as council officers have addressed all the issues. There is adequate and will be good solar access to the building to the south where the objectors are from. We have addressed amenity, we have addressed deep soil, we've addressed car parking. So all the issues that they've raised have been addressed. It, the planning proposal did not have to be amended to address the issues. 
I, I would just add to that. Of course, the other issues in relation to noise, waste, um, fire hazard, odour. The development control plan requires a plan of management to be developed for the site. Those, they're real operational issues which aren't linked to the planning proposal at all, but are noted and will be looked at as part of any plan of management that came in if a DA or when a DA is lodged. So I guess the issues that, that I hear that can be dealt with or we somehow managed it is the light and the privacy. Yes, they have been and addressed. That's with the setback, yes, the setbacks and the solar analysis that was lodged by the by the planning um, by the proponent, which was checked by the council's independent design um, architectus, and also the Department of Planning checked the solar analysis as well. There is there will be three plus hours of solar um, to those windows that face that side. And was it previously you said from nine and out from ten to three at uh, twelve to three? Okay. Parts, as I said, parts of the site. If you're looking at Millet Street and looking at the residential flat building where the objectors live, the left hand side of that site is about thirty metres from the development site doesn't have any impact on its solar access. The closest part of the site, I think, that, um, that the objectors live in is about eight metres from the boundary. They, um, no, it's, yeah, about eight metres from the boundary. Their solar access starts at about just after 12 o'clock. Now, the existing shadow, yeah, and it's midwinter, yeah, sorry. The existing shadow, for, for that part of the site. Yeah. The existing shadows for the for the existing nursing home cover um, that part of the building, which is only set eight metres from um, the nursing home site, um, between the nursing home proposed building and the residential flat building where the objectors are, the, the shadows are basically on par. So the existing shadow is similar to the proposed shadow. Okay. Yeah. So were these changes made after it was on exhibition? No, these changes were made, were re requested from the proponent prior to it going up to council in October last year. So when, it went on, so when, when did it go on exhibition? It went on exhibition this year, um, between early May to early June. But we, we know that through experience, we, we know that with this type of planning proposal, the main issues are overshadowing and privacy. So as council officers, we made sure that those issues were addressed. Um, we, we, as council, I don't put up reports that I can't recommend for approval. So the proponent had to go through all the hoops for four years before he got um, approval for us to ex um, exhibit the plan. So it doesn't, the planning proposal doesn't need change because it's addressing privacy and solar impacts. Okay, and then the next question I was gonna ask, um, did we pass that information on, which I imagine would, but in the language, um, that would be appropriate for them? Because I think that there's something, it, there seems to be two different views and they're not understanding that the changes that's been made and that you've addressed those issues. Yeah. Everyone who came to the counter um, was met by a council strategic planner and we have all the diagrams available. I, I know that strategic planner sat down with um, people who came and asked to speak to her. So I, I don't know whether or not the people who spoke tonight came in and spoke with the council officers. If we do have someone whose second language, um, whose first language is not English, we do have an interpreter and that's where Jane, who assisted tonight, assists the council officers. So I don't know if they make time to me. 
with the staff. Okay, maybe that's something we can um, arrange, Ben. So is that it for you, Councillor Jamison? Um, the mayor has a question, I believe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I rise to support this application because I do believe it's gone through a rigorous process of merit-based assessment. I think that uh, all the questions that have been asked prove to me, and I'm sure prove to you, that they've done everything they could, the council officers have done everything they could to mitigate against the uh, impact on the next door neighbours. With regards to overshadowing, I think that uh, an eight metre setback is not a bad setback. I don't think you'll get that on many buildings, especially buildings which are three storeys to that setback and four storeys further on into the uh, uh, into the centre. Um, with and if you actually look at the diagram that's, that uh, indicated in the um, report, you'll find that the building uh, of the people, the building in which which um, are occupied by the people who are uh, objecting is three storeys also. And it's almost right next to the boundaries. I think that was um, a design that shot the whole development in its own foot. When you're about one and a half to two metres away from the boundary, admittedly, it's only for a short distance, it's only for a short distance, that you've actually, you're actually inviting an impact on you. Now, having said that, the proponent in this case has gone ahead and said, right, I'm listening to the council officers. They're saying we want six metres, which then gives it an overall eight metres, and, um, and therefore it alleviates the issue and the problem almost altogether. Having said all that, um, I, as I said to you before, there is no way you're going to get an eight metre height limit on a three or four storey building. Um, that, that eight metre height limit actually occurs somewhere around a five or six storey building. Now, let's have a look at what we're talking about here. On the way, in the one situation, we've got aged and disabled housing. Um, it's now called seniors living. It used to be called aged and disabled housing. So if you have a disability and if you were over the age of 55, you could actually live in one of those. And that included residential flat buildings back in those days. The amount of care that they got in seniors living and um, in aged and disabled housing was on call. The doctors were on call. You had to be close to some certain amenity shops, etc. The next stage to the aging process is this, is the nursing home. And that's what it used to be called for a long, long time. The nursing home. It provides 20 hours care um, and it provides um, doctors, medical, food, uh, dining facilities, washing facilities, the whole lot. It's actually, at, they're now called aged care uh, facilities for, uh, for that purpose. What, but what happened? What happened? A few years ago, there was, there were many, many, many complaints, more than we have now with regards to aged and disabled housing or nursing homes. Uh, many complaints about the standard of care that was being given, the standard of housing that they were being provided. So the government decided, first of all, to offload it to state care, because it used to be in a uh, Australia, it was used to be a federal government, uh, a federal government provision. Now it's a state government provision. And what they what they said is you've got to have, um, for instance, you've, you've got to get rid of those walls that have four to five beds in them. Now, the reason why I'm fully a favourite is because I've been involved with at least two of them. And, and upgrading them from uh, what you might call run down, obsolete, poor care, poor environments to more like, I suppose, the modern day boarding houses, which is one bed, a little kitchenette maybe, but they don't have those in nursing homes because you've actually got dining rooms. Now, having been involved, what does it mean? It means they, the government says, we want one bedroom wards. We want them all to have on suites. The most you can have is two, other, two bedrooms in a ward. Otherwise, you lose points. In other words, once you start losing points, the major points were in compliance with the building code. Many of them even failed on that. You had to get 25 
with like 100% compliance with the building code, and then you have all the other amenities. Like, for instance, what causes this nursing home or aged care facility to be demolished is the fact that the corridors have to now be 1.8 wide so that they can swing straight in, and they have to provide a certain amount of dining area, a certain amount of a lounge area, a certain amount of... It's, it's really providing um, what you might call up, not upmarket care, but proper care, proper facilities for these for these residents. Now, it also says it's limited to 100. <laughs> this is not like saying, like arguing the toss with, let's say, for instance, take, for example, a, um, what do you call it, a, uh, a place of public worship where someone says, I can fit 10 people in here, and somebody else says, but I can fit 55 or 60 people in here. What it, this is like one bed, one room, two beds, two rooms. It's not, you can't fit any more than one bed in a one bedroom, a designated one bedroom room. That's the, that's the requirements. These are government, this is government legislation. Now, why it has to be so big? Because the requirements now are horrendous. I wouldn't say horrendous. The requirements that say are appropriate to provide that good care and good accommodation for those residents. And to give you an example, we had, and, it's, and I'll name the place, it's the uh, Gundy Nursing Home or Gundy Aged Care Facility down at Jersey Road, Stratford. It had 86 residents. 86 were put back in. Now, what happened was they had to buy the property next door. They had to buy the property next door. The little place that they had, which they fit 84 people in, they demolished the property next door. They built a two-story building, and they moved those people. In, they moved those people from what was the existing property. Yes. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. I think, even though I thought you were asking a question, clearly you were speaking to your motion, which. Um, Sorry. That's fine, um, but it sounds like we might need an extension of time if you're going to Just continue. Oh, okay, okay. okay, moved by Councillor Borgan, seconded by Councillor okay. Tegg. Thank, Thank you. you. So what I'm trying to say here is that when they bought the place next door, they demolished the place next door, they moved the 84 people, a little bit more squashed in the stage one, and then they demolished the place where they had the 84 residents and moved and spread them out. So basically, they had to double, they had to double the floor space for the same number of people. In this case, they've virtually done the same thing. They're virtually doubling the area for the same number of people. Yes, like always, back in those days, we did go to Land Environment Court. And I've got to say, I'll tell you a little bit. I suppose it's a bit of a funny, actually. The commissioner went on site, visited the aged care facility, saw seven beds in one room, five beds in another, three beds in another, went down the hallway, walked outside, and then did his approval right on the spot. We're talking about providing proper care to the proper um, to people that are ageing. They're not just seeing this. They are old and frail. That's what it's coming to. The last comment I'd like to make is that the person that was gearing the attack on this senior's living uh, was an elderly gentleman in the street. He's now in that aged care facility. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as that wasn't a question that you were speaking in support of the motion that you moved, um, I'll go to the second. Did you wish to speak to this, Councillor Tegg? Uh, look, only just very briefly, uh, Madam Chair. Oh, look. I think through the questions and through the contributions, we've certainly had, I think, all that we need to make our decisions. I would just like to um, express my gratitude um, to the staff member um, who was able to provide the translation services this evening. Obviously, it's very important in such a multicultural community that everyone, regardless of their confidence in the uh, English language, should feel able and willing to contribute to our public debate. So I'd like to thank those who might have overcome some personal barriers if I had to do this in language that's not English. I was out here doing it in Spanish, I can assure you all um, that you'd, you'd understand every third word at best. Um, so I want to thank the, those members of the community um, who've come here to contribute um, despite those language barriers and thank our staff member for her efforts tonight to, to enable that to happen. Thank you, Councillor Tegg. Uh, is there anyone who would like to speak against this motion? 
Yeah, Councillor Wayne. Yeah, so I, I've been very brief because uh, I have asked quite a few questions already. So, so I understand that the nursing home is allowed in the you know uh, B two or not R two zone, but the, in my experience, the commercial facilities does not always mix well with the, the residents. Yeah, just as you have heard, lots of. Food complaints already from about the, the amenity about the traffic and parking and the old um, and and everything and um, with the increase of the, the the nursing home we can only expect the, the friction and conflict to increase so that's uh, one of my concern and uh, i understand that the the objective of this uh, da not the this pp is to improve the quality of life of some of the vulnerable people in the nursing home. But it's just sad to see it seems to hurting the other group of equally vulnerable people. I'm just not convinced the amenity can be protected, but through the future DA process, if you know, if the you know the the, the framework is set to increase the, the capacity of the building. So that's why. So I uh, ask uh, every councillor to consider to just uh, put more thoughts on it. Just put on hold for this uh, PP. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Wang. Would anybody else like to speak in favour? Did um, um, with the agreements of, um, of Madam Chair, I just would like to ask one question. Sure. Certainly. I, I know I'm not a member of the committee. Councillor Symington, go the, ahead. To, to, to Director or to Ms McMahon, could you? Please, um, do you know how long the nursing home has actually been operating there in Gloucester Road? Yeah, I believe it's been operating for years, um, but I don't know. I don't have the exact date. So probably decades. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ms. Ms. McMahon. Um, did anyone want to speak in favour of this? Anyone else want to speak against? No. Oh, I'll just say a couple of words in favour, if that's okay. In favour, sure. Council um, Yeah, thank you to the council officers for a um, very um, detailed report providing us lots of information to make our decision. Um, I, I feel like you, the issues that were raised in the public forum around the noise and the privacy and the amenity that your report and the feedback that you've given tonight does address those um, issues. Um, I've had two grandparents who've ended their lives in nursing, nursing homes and I know that those facilities can definitely do for, with better um, facilities um, and so I think that this seems to be a very modest um, change to the zoning at the side, especially in an area like Herzl, which we see has got quite drastic height increases. So this seems a, modern, a modest increase and if that's to the benefit of the residents that are living there, um, then that is the reason that I will support the motion. Um, I, I hear the concerns raised by the residents um, and um, I think that perhaps if there is some sort of forum that we can um, provide clear information to the residents so they, they do understand the changes that have been um, made to that and that the concerns have mostly been addressed in the report. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Borg. Just before we um, go to vote, I would just like to say a couple of things myself, if that's okay with your indulgence, councillors. Um, I wanted to thank the members of the gallery that came tonight to address us as councillors. It's always important for us to hear your views on issues like this that affect you directly. Uh, I also think it's a very comprehensive report, as Ms McMahon mentioned during her address earlier. The council officers have been working on this for quite some time and it still does have a bit of a way to go and we've got the planning proposal that would go to the department should it make through it make through make its way through the committee tonight. That's got to be gazetted. There would have to be a DA, there would have to be a plan of management and other bits and pieces to address some of these concerns. And I would like to think that many of your concerns, if they haven't been addressed so far, can be addressed during those processes down the track. It is, as it's an existing facility when, and there is no go, there will be no increase in beds. I think that's an important thing to remember. I understand your concerns, Councillor Wang, but based on some of the 
horror stories we've seen on aged care facilities. This one isn't at that stage yet, but it doesn't make the grade, it doesn't meet the standards. And we do need to provide um, our older residents uh, a place that they can spend their final years in dignity and, and well cared for. And I would like to see um, facilities spend the amount of time to actually address it rather than just shut them down. And as Ms McVine mentioned, it could be at risk of shutting down if this didn't go ahead. So um, councils think very carefully where we go from here. And that's enough from me, but I think we'll need to probably go around the room for this one. Mr Mayor, your vote please. For, for the uh, approval. Madam Chair. For. Councillor Ball. Four. Councillor Johnson. I'm going to abstain. Councillor Teague. For the motion. Councillor Wang. Against the motion. Three votes for, one against, one abstain. Sorry, four votes for. Thank you, Ms McKinley. So we will declare that one carried. Thank you. We'll move on to the next item, which is ENV 024-22, request to amend the voluntary planning agreement for 108, 112 and 124 Forest Road and 1 and 3 Wright Street, Hurstville. Um, Ms Bishop. I'm happy to move that. Oh, sorry, we need to move that first. So you're going to move that, Councillor Tech? Can I get a second for that? I'll second. Seconded by the Mayor. Thank you. Ms Bishop, if you could just provide us with an overview of this. Yes, Ms. Uh, I think Ms McMahon has comprehensively yeah, prepared for this item as well. <laughs> oh, through you, Madam Chair. This report relates to an existing voluntary planning agreement between Council and at Shanghai Lahu Hurstville Propage Limited SLH 108 Propage Limited relating to the what's known as the Bing Lee site at 108, 112 and 124 Forest Road and one and number one and number three Bright Street, Hurstville. It was executed on the 26th of March, 2016 and required the developer to pay a cash contribution of basically $3.7 million to council, which he has done so. And secondly, to dedicate land for the expansion and upgrade um, to allow for future road widening along Forest Road frontage of the site between Hudson Street and Wright Street. This land has yet to be dedicated to council. So the BPA relates to the development of the Bing Lee site under LEP Amendment 13 to the former Hurstville LEP. And as I and this was this LEP was gazetted on the 28th of February 2019. The planning agreement requires that the road widening big area, land area, be dedicated to council within five years from the date of gazette of the LEP, meaning the 28th of February, 2024. And for those councillors who don't know what's been approved for the Bingley site, um, it's been, the whole site's been rezoned to a B4 mixed use site increase of the maximum building height um, to 34.5 metres along Forest Road, uh, up to 46.5 metres along Forest Road. Increase the floor space ratio of the site to four to one, and which includes a minimum non-residential floor area of 0.5 to one. And remember this was gazetted back in February, 2019. So Council received a request from the developers to amend the terms of the existing VPA agreement in respect of the timing for the dedication of the land for road widening along Forest Road. The developer has requested that the, um, to defer the dedication for another two years. So instead of being February 2024, he's asked that it be February 2026. Now there are existing buildings and businesses, including the Bing Lee store and an auto service centre that are located within the land area to be dedicated. And the timing for the dedication of the land in the BPA recognised the operation of these businesses and as such did not require the land to be dedicated any earlier. 
Uh, back in October 2021, uh, development's consent was issued for the development of the site for a mixed-use development comprising of 213 residential apartments. So, and that is um, consistent with the planning proposal concept that um, was considered by Council a number of years ago. The consent requires that the terms of the BPA be complied with um, and the approved plans, approved area plans do show the land dedication. So as I said, the developer has requested, and that's the only change to the planning agreement, has requested that the time frame be increased from five years from the date of Gazette to seven years. So council will still get the land um, prior to the 28th of February, 2026. Uh, this amendment to the planning agreement was referred to the council's assets and infrastructure section, and they've raised no concerns with the request to extend the dedication time frame and have advised that it will not cause any issues for the construction and signalisation of the Forest Road, Durnham Street intersection that's currently under construction. Um, any amendment to the terms of the planning agreement requires both parties to agree to the changes, um, and that has happened. Both council officers and, um, and the proponent have agreed to the changes. Um, council solicitors have prepared the draft amendment to the planning agreement, and the developer has agreed to pay all costs associated with the proposed amendments. So in summary, this report recommends that council in doors, the first deed of variation to the BPA for the Bingley site for only one change to increase the timing um, from five years to seven years, so February 2026. And um, as pointed out, it has been Council's normal practice to delegate um, such minor matters to the general manager um, relating to a deed of variation following public exhibition as well as enter into the deed on behalf of council. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Um, um, I actually just have one quick question, whether it's to you, Cathy, or to Ms. Bishop. They've asked for it to be extended to seven years. Is there a, a limit as to how many times they can request that? The development consent was issued um, in October 2021, they have to commence before the 18th of October 2021. So they have to actually commence, sorry, before the, 20, the 18th of October 2026. So it actually works with the consent. Yeah. I was yes. in with that. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah. Councillors, do we have any questions? Oh, Councillor Jamison, sorry. <laughs> sorry, um, can I ask a couple of questions? So why would somebody ask for an extension of time? Is it because they haven't built yet or? They received development consent last year for the building. Um, they haven't got their construction certificate yet. It's quite a significant building and that will take some time. Plus funding, uh, banks are basically asking for 100% arms sale before they give money for funding. So he needs the extra time um, for bank finance and to prepare the construction plans. Um, it, the two extra years also gives the council's assets and infrastructure um, time to put it into the capital works program as well. So it, it's also a benefit to us. We're, we're not ready. We, we, um, our biggest inter intersection construction will be that Forest Road, Durnham Street for this financial year into the next financial year. The other question is, as costs are rising per year, does that mean that the amount that they've agreed to initially may not be enough to, to agree for? They've already paid the $3.7 million to council. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Will it cost yeah. more if it's two years later, like, you know, one year? the difference that it's made the cost for one year to another would increase. There, the there may be some increasing costs, but our council infrastructure team is not ready for to do this work. Uh, further, there are businesses that are thriving and doing very well within that road widening area. Um, if council were to force the planning agreement and uh, request the developer to um, excise the land and dedicate to council. We, 
council would require requires the land free of any structures. It would actually close down those businesses because the developer would have to demolish the businesses, the buildings in which the businesses are in. So it's it it there will be some costs, but I think um, it's of benefit that we keep those businesses open at the present because as we're not ready to accept the road widening land at this point in time. Councillor Jamison, did that answer your question? Yes. Councillors, any further questions? Councillor Chair. So just, just so that I understand, the um, the road widening goes over more than just the Bingley site or have those two other sites to the sort of east also, are they also part of the package that's being developed? It goes between Hudson and um, Right. Yes, Hudson and Wright, but right so the Bingley's yeah. at the Hudson side. Does, yeah. it, does the new building go all the way? Yeah. To, it, oh, okay. It so goes all the way. We actually get a, um, yeah, a so nice uh, shop top building. Also not just what's currently the Bingley no. side. Yeah. Yeah. Side. Okay, that's fine. I just understood. Councillor Tegridge, want to speak to this motion? Okay. Uh, Councillor Catrus, as a seconder, did you want to speak to this? We're up to. Uh, yeah, we've had our questions, so <laughs> you missed that. ENV 024, the Bingley site. Yeah, you're okay? Okay, did anybody want to speak against it? All right, um, just before we do go to a vote, I'll say, look, I traditionally have not voted in support of this particular development and voted against it, I think, the last time it came to us, but given the fact that um, we're extending the time out to um, take out the being lay shop, et cetera, I'm quite happy to support it in this particular instance and because it's normally my practice to be consistent, but uh, this wouldn't make much difference if I didn't support it either. So anyway, we'll, we'll put to a vote and I think Ms McKinley will probably need to go around the room for it. Your vote, please, Mr. May. Madam Chair? Four. Councillor Ball? Four. Councillor Jamison? Four. Councillor Marnie? Four. Councillor Teague? For the motion. Councillor Wang? For the motion. That's unanimous. Right, thank you. We will declare that one carried and we will move to our next item, which is ENB 025-22. Merriman Reserve Master Plan Options for Public Exhibition. If I could get a mover and a seconder, please. The uh, recommendation. Moved by the Mayor and seconded by Councillor Borg. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bishop, are you, uh, are you again? <laughs> yep. All right. This report relates to Merriman Reserve Master Plan, uh, which uh, councillors had been briefed on, I think, a couple of months ago. A draft plan of management and master plan are currently underway uh, for Merriman Reserve at Kyle Bay by um, consultants in conjunction with council officers. Merriman Reserve is a 1.3 hectare public reserve um, located on the foreshore of Kyle Bay. It consists of both council-owned community land and a crown reserve. The reserve is covered by an existing plan of management and landscape concept plan, which was adopted by Cobra Council back in 2013. But given the age of the existing plan of management and landscape concept plan, a new plan of management master plan is required to be updated to recognise the management actions and objectives of the Georges River Foreshore Access and Improvement Plan and the Georges River Coastal Zone Management Plan as well as cover the Crown Land Reserve. Uh, two draft master plan options have been prepared um, for tonight's report. And uh, just to remind councillors, a master plan is an overarching spatial layout, a diagram uh, used to guide the development of the land. It will be accompanied by um, a plan of management, but at this stage that hasn't been prepared. The development of the two master plans option of the two master plan options is based on the feedback from the community on how they currently use or access the reserve and to seek ideas on future uses and activities in the reserve. This preliminary consultation was held from the 15th of November to the 7th of December last year. A majority of the respondents visiting the reserve accessed the foreshore area and the space. 
um, retaining existing views, the ambulance at the M uh, yeah, of the reserve was the most special with over 100 respondents proclaiming its importance to the site. The respondents like the walking paths, the community facilities um, were also strongly sought after. And the majority of the respondents wanted pedestrian for sure access, as well as a, a facility that could be enjoyed for food and beverage. So there's strong community support for seating, tables, picnic settings along that foreshore area and to take advantage of the views. So that's why the two master plan options have been developed and they're explained in paragraphs 31 to 35 of the report. But in summary, option one is really what is existing now. It's just embellishment and updates. Option two is more visionary. It's creating a larger, more flexible, informal recreation area fronting the foreshore and removing the parking away from the water's edge. And that parking will be consolidated on what is now called Bowling Green One. The report recommends that Council place the two options on exhibition um, to get feedback on both options. Uh, we either stay with the, quote, uh, the status quo with option one, or we try and be more visionary and address what the public has raised as um, items that they would like to see um, at Maryman Reserve. So that's why the officers are recommending that we put the both options on exhibition. We haven't chosen an option or recommended an option to council. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McMahon. Does uh, anyone have any questions of either Ms. McMahon or Ms. Bishop? Councillor okay. <laughs> Jamison. Thanks. Uh, just a question for point 23, um, and it's just the consultation points, and it's touching a multifaceted approach, which is great. I'm just thinking, just from what we've had experience with the Maltdale area, just with what we're doing now, would it be worth getting signs up? Um, just for anyone that's using the park that they can see that there's a plan of management on post? I think that's a good idea. We can put some signs up to say um, that there's the exhibition on the options and if they've got a smartphone they can um, scan that or we can put the officers um, contact details and the general phone number. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a good option. Add to it there. I think, yeah. Councillor Jamis, if you look at paragraph 40, that tells you ex exactly what the consultation that Ms McMahon and her team are looking at. We will also have consultation down on the site as well. But I think we can add signs is a, is a good contribution to spreading, to getting feedback. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Catrice, you moved. This item, did you want to speak to it? Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Borg, did you wish to speak to it? Anybody else wish to speak to it? Speak against it? Okay, let's uh, take a vote then if we could, Ms McKinley. Mr Mayor, your vote please. Four. Madam Chair? Four. Councillor Borg? Four. Councillor Jamison? Four. Councillor Marnie? Four. Councillor Tegg? For the motion. Councillor Wang? For the motion. Seven votes for unanimous. I'm not on, sorry. We will declare that one carried. Uh, and as that was our last item for this evening, uh, we can close the meeting at 8.28 p.m. Thank you to everybody for coming and thank you to council officers for all your work in putting together this report and Ms McMahon and Ms Bishop for all of your <laughs> answers of questions tonight. Thank you and good night. <laughs>